How is up, y'all? Top of cracking it's D. About to react to a Mr. Ball in bed. It's titled "Top Two Sounds Fake, but it's a hundred percent true stories. Parties that change literally everything." I haven't reacted to him in a while. I stopped reacting to him because people were just not interested. <laughs> so you know, obviously, I'm gonna go based on what y'all want to see, what y'all are interested in. And if uh, the analytics don't reflect that there's much interest, then I'll just completely stop reacting to certain channels and whatnot but you know every now and then i might tap back in see what they're up to um see what kind of videos they're putting out uh so somebody requested this and i said why not I feel like i haven't reacted to him in like a year it's been a long time anyway uh we're gonna see what these uh stories are though let's watch sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction and today i'm gonna share two stories that demonstrate that but before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button leaves their phone out unattended, go ahead and pick it up and spam passwords over and over again until it locks them out of their phone for a week. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's stories. Mm -hmm. Around 8 p.m. on December 16th, 2023, a 31-year-old man named Nestor Flores was driving down a highway just outside of Dallas, Texas, with both his hands tightly gripping the steering wheel. Nestor was very stressed out on this ride. All he wanted to do was get home because he was worried that on this ride, he might get pulled over by police. I mean, this was a route he had driven a bunch, and he knew there were loads of state troopers that patrolled the area. And from his perspective, it seemed like they kind of pulled people over all the time. And Nestor had spent the night out with a couple of friends, and he had had a couple of drinks. You know, he didn't feel he had had too much to where he couldn't drive. But he knew if he did get pulled over, you know, he could be in trouble. And then on top of that, you know, in the back of Nestor's mind was the fact that he had had a couple of minor run-ins with the law over the past couple of years. And so he kind of had this He's fear French. of police already. And also, Nestor was not born in America. And so he was worried that on top of all that, if he got pulled Racism. over, you know, he could risk being deported. And so on whole, Nestor just does not want to see any police officer. He just wants to get home and go to bed. And so as Nestor is doing his best to not draw any suspicion to himself and is trying to follow all the rules of the road, he decides to have a sip of his Diet Coke. And his Diet Coke was right in the middle console. And so as he's driving eyes straight ahead, he reaches down and he grabs the Coke, he pulls it up, he uncaps it, takes a sip. But then as he puts the drink back down, again, he's keeping his eyes on the road, he hits something with the drink. And he feels the drink slosh out of his cup and it hits his hand. And instinctively, you know, he took his eyes off the road and looked down at the Coke and he managed to put the drink back in his cup holder. And then when he brought his eyes back to the road, deer. there was a deer in the middle of the road. He was too close to swerve out of the way. And so at full speed, he smashes into this deer the deer hits his front windshield and basically caves in the passenger side windshield mm. and flips up and over the back of his car and Nestor amazingly was composed enough to not swerve wildly post impact because he knew if he did that he could run into oncoming traffic or something and so he just kept on going straight and gradually slowed down and pulled off the side of the road and as he did he looked over his shoulder seeing if this deer was basically lying in the road or even worse maybe it hit some other car but when he looked over his shoulder, the road was clear. There was no deer. Now, even though Nestor was obviously very shaken up at this point, I mean, he just had this horrible car accident with this deer, and he's already on edge about getting pulled over by police. But for the moment, it was just peaceful on the highway. You know, no cops were coming up to him, and he's pulled over to the side. You know, physically, he was okay. You know, it seemed like the deer was okay. It clearly ran off the road or something. And there was damage to his car. I mean, the deer really smashed in the front of his car, and the windshield, especially on the passenger side, was basically caved in. But Nestor was able to see through his side of the windshield, and when he put the car back in drive and hit the gas, the car seemed to drive just fine. And so even though Nestor felt kind of bad that he had smashed this deer, he thought, you know, what am I going to do? Go find the deer and make sure it's okay? Like, he can't really do anything. It's nighttime. And so he made the decision that, you know, nobody saw this and it seems like everything's okay. So I'm just going to drive said, home Fuck that, dude. I'll take care of my car tomorrow. But after driving 38 more miles from the impact site, Nestor's car began making this horrible rattling sound from the engine. And also smoke began to billow up out of the front of his car. 
And so Nestor knew, you know, this is so conspicuous. He's going to get pulled over if he doesn't stop. And so feeling really annoyed because he was actually pretty close to home at this point, Nestor pulled off the highway and came to a stop in a parking lot of a fast food restaurant. And so at first, all Nestor did was just turn off his car and wait for a couple of minutes in hopes that, you know, that would be enough to cure his car. But after a couple of minutes, you know, the smoke continued to billow out of his car. And then when he tried to turn it back on again, the car simply wouldn't start. And so at this point, Nestor knew he had to call a tow truck. But when he reached for his phone, his phone was dead. And he didn't have a phone charger in his car. And so he's like, great, I can't even call a tow truck. But then he looked up and saw the fast food restaurant was open. And he decided he would just go in there. And he would ask one of them if they had a charger. So Nestor gets out of his smoking car, he walks into the restaurant, he goes up to the counter, and he asks the person behind the counter, like, hey, you know, my phone's dead, do you have a charger? Do you mind charging my phone? But the employee, they didn't say anything back to Nestor. They just stood there with their mouths open and their eyes wide, staring at Nestor, like they couldn't believe what they were looking at. And so Nestor's thinking, like, what's wrong with this person? You know, hey, do you have a charger or not? And the employee, who by this point is pale as a ghost, just shook their head at Nestor, like, no, they don't have a charger. And then they just stood there, still staring at Nestor. And so now Nestor is genuinely just furious. I mean, the whole night has completely derailed here. All he wanted to do was get home, and it's like one horrible thing happens after another. And so Nestor was just like, okay, fine. And he turned around, and he left the restaurant, and went back to his car, thinking maybe if I search the whole vehicle, you know, there's bound to be a charger in there somewhere. And so Nestor gets back into his car, he climbs into the driver's seat, he shuts the door, and as he begins looking around his car for this charger, he begins to feel really sleepy. And actually, he eventually just kind of leans forward and falls asleep in his car. More than two hours later, Nestor woke up to the sound of somebody tapping on his window. And so Nestor groggily turned and looked, and it was like the worst case scenario. It was a police officer who was shining his flashlight into the vehicle, clearly gesturing for Nestor to roll his window down. And so Nestor was totally compliant. He rolled the window down and he looked at the officer. And before Nestor could even say anything, the officer said, get out of the car. So Nestor, he gets out of the car and he's thinking to himself, you know, why is he acting so aggressively towards me? Like, what have I done here? And so Nestor, you know, he gets out of the car and again, before Nestor can ask any questions, the officer just says to Nestor, what happened tonight? Like, what's going on here? And so Nestor, you know, he knows his car is jacked up and here he is sleeping in the parking lot. And so he turns to the officer and begins explaining the deer story. You know, he was driving down the road, he hits this deer, you know, went over the top, he didn't see it, he didn't report it. And as he's telling the officer this, he's thinking, oh my gosh, like, is there a law? Like, if you hit a deer, are you supposed to report it? Is that what's going on? No. Maybe the deer did die, and it was in the middle of the road, and somebody saw his license plate, and now the cop was here. And so Nestor began to panic, you know, trying to explain the logic behind leaving the deer and how sorry he was. He should have stopped. He should have called the police. But the officer finally just put up his hand, telling Nestor to stop talking. And then the officer took his flashlight, and he shined it past Nestor at his car. And when the officer did that, the officer immediately grabbed his radio and began barking orders into it, saying he needed backup. And so Nestor's like, what is going on here? Like, this whole night has been such a disaster. Like, what did I do? And so Nestor, he turned to see what the cop was looking at on his car that would elicit such a big response from him. And when he looked at the passenger seat of his car, where the cop's light was now shining, Nestor froze for a second and then just started to scream. It would turn out that even though Nestor believed he had only had, you know, a few drinks and he was okay to drive, the reality was he was completely annihilated drunk and should never... You didn't say he was drunk. You said he was tired. Or Ben behind the wheel. And when he was driving on the highway, you know, anxiously trying to get home, he did well, he didn't hit a deer. He hit a 45-year-old pedestrian named Terry Ivory, and he hit this guy with so much force that Terry went through the windshield on the passenger side and, he was and in then the landed car? in the passenger seat, minus one leg, which had been severed on impact. And then Terry's dead body sat there in the passenger seat with Nestor having no idea. He thinks there's a deer back there, but there was never a deer. There's just a dead guy next to him. And Nestor just drove 40 more miles with Terry's dead body next to him. And then when Nestor's car began to smoke and make noises, he pulled off the highway to that fast food restaurant what? parking lot. And they saw blood And then on when him. he went inside the restaurant to try to get a phone charger, the reason that employee was so shocked to see Nestor and could basically not even speak when Nestor was trying to talk to them was because Nestor was covered practically head to toe in blood, Terry's blood. 
Now, it's not entirely clear why that employee did not immediately call police, but, you know, after Nestor left the restaurant, went back to his car, and fell asleep, during the time Nestor was sleeping, Nestor someone inside the restaurant did call the police, and that's why they showed up and knocked on Nestor's glass. Wait, Nestor this, is, this is the crime scene? I want to see a better picture of the car, of the vehicle. Is it this red one? I know you fucking lying, Nestor. Jail! did call the police, and that's why they showed up and knocked on Nestor's glass. Nestor was charged with collision involving death in December of 2023. However, his case has not yet been adjudicated. Wow, trifling! Earlier this year, we announced our very first Mr. Bolin... Y'all go support. Oh, he got uh, books now? Work. We went on you. And sh Okay. On the afternoon of December 15th, 1997, a brand new mother named Luz Cuevas sat on her couch in her little apartment in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, cradling her beautiful 10-day-old baby girl, who she had named so Della cute. Marvera. And in the room with Luz and her daughter were some members of Luz's extended family like who'd come over to meet the baby. Story. And so for about an hour, the family all took turns, you know, holding the baby and complimenting how cute her little dimples looked. And then eventually the baby started to get fussy, at which point Luz said she was going to take her upstairs and put her to bed. And so Luz brought Delamar upstairs to her nursery and she put the baby down in her crib and she stayed with her for a bit until Delamar finally had kind of dozed off to sleep. And so after being sure that her daughter wasn't going to stir, Luz got up and she began making her way towards the door. And right before she left, she made sure to plug in the space heater for her daughter's room to make sure it would stay warm enough while her daughter slept. Mm -hmm. And then after that, she left the room, no, shut the nursery door, and went back downstairs to rejoin her family. Luz's family didn't stick around much longer after Luz came downstairs. Fire. And after they were all gone, Luz realized she was totally exhausted and her daughter was still fast asleep upstairs. And so Luz decided she would also lie down and try to take a nap herself. But as soon as she closed her eyes, she heard this loud thud sound coming from the second floor. And it sounded like something really heavy had smashed into the ground. And she's thinking, you know, her daughter's up there. Could that be her daughter somehow falling out of the crib or something? And so Luz jumped up, sprinted upstairs. And as she looked down the hall, she could clearly see there was black smoke billowing out of her daughter's nursery. And so Luz charges down the hall. She opens up the door and she looks into her daughter's room and it's completely engulfed in flames. I mean, everything is on fire, but it's her baby girl in there. And so without any hesitation, Luz charges into the inferno. But when she gets up to the crib, like the crib is so completely on fire mm. that when she looks in, she can't even see her daughter. And so in a craze, she begins looking around the room thinking maybe my daughter did fall out of the crib. And she somewhere else in the room but everything is on fire she can't see anything and so as Luz is like literally catching on fire and breathing in all the smoke she's screaming for her daughter and then a couple of minutes later firefighters burst into the door and they literally drag Luz out of the nursery she hasn't found her daughter she's screaming you know where's my baby but the firefighters they bring her outside and just a couple of minutes later they were able to extinguish this blaze and after they came out of the house again, so they found Luz, who had all these terrible burns in her body, and she's totally messed up from this fire. And they tell her that, unfortunately, her daughter was dead. After Delamar's death, Luz's life completely fell apart. I mean, the grief well, was you... so oh. immense. It was like she could no longer function in society. I mean, she actually retracted from the world, stopped interacting with people, didn't see her family. She wound up getting a divorce from her husband just over the grief and the sadness of losing this child. I mean, it was like her life basically ended when her daughter's life ended. But on top of that, Luce also felt this incredible sense of guilt because after the fire, the investigators told her that the cause of the fire, although not conclusive, was very likely from that space heater she had plugged in Aye. right before she had left the room. And so, of course, you know, Luce is feeling this incredible burden for having potentially killed her daughter, but also she just began to obsess over the details because, again, it wasn't conclusive that it was the space heater. That was their best guess as to what caused the fire. And so Luce began to wonder, like, was it something else? Was it preventable? You know, like, what was it? Basically, Luce became completely obsessed with what happened to her daughter. It was like the only thing she ever thought of for years. Fast forward to January 24th, 2004. So six years after the fire. 
And on this day, Luce was invited to a family party. There was a get together and, you know, Luce basically never went to any family function or really left her house much at all. But for some reason on this day, she decided to go out. And so she goes to this party and when she gets there, you know, remember, Luce has basically been a recluse for the past six years. And so she's not going to immediately start socializing. And so instead, she just goes in the house and kind of finds a spot in the back, kind of away from everybody else who's chatting and just stands there, kind of people watching. And as she's doing that, something catches her attention off to the side. And when she turns to look at it and sees what it is, she immediately just freezes. Three days later, Luce walked into the office of a local state legislator, and after saying hello, she sat down, reached into her purse, and pulled out a little plastic bag that contained a folded up napkin. And she slid it across the table to the legislator. And so he picked up the bag and stared at it inquisitively as Luce dove into this wild explanation about what was in this bag and why she was here. And at the end of this totally off the wall, insane sounding story, the legislator was left just kind of staring at Luce and looking back at the bag in total shock. And then finally, after a couple of moments of silence, the legislator just said, okay, yeah, I'll see what I can do. It would turn out the fire was not caused by the space heater that Luce had plugged in right before she left her daughter's room. Instead, mm -hmm. police believe after Luce came downstairs and tried to take a nap, somebody broke into her apartment went into the nursery and set the fire on purpose, but not before abducting the baby. And that oh. person was one of Luce's own family members oh. who had been at her apartment that day celebrating the birth of Della Marvera. It was Luce's husband's cousin, Carolyn Correa. And in fact, on this same day, before the fire and before the abduction, Carolyn made a point to announce to the whole family that she was pregnant, even though she wasn't. It was just going to be her cover story for why she suddenly had this brand new baby. Six years later, when Luce was at that family party, well, the thing that caught her attention her on daughter. the other side of the room was her daughter. She literally saw her daughter, and even though she hadn't seen her in six years, she instantly knew it was her because of her distinctive dimples. Now, Luce knew she couldn't just suddenly yell Yeah, that like baby, that. come on. What, wait, wait, I'm so confused. What? So when they found no human remains literally at all, they were like, oh, yeah, the baby just must have completely got burnt up and there's just no sign of it. Even if a body is completely burned, there there will be some remains to some degree. No, no, they'll just completely evaporate. There will be something there. That's my daughter. So instead, she came up with this plan. She walked up to the girl and very discreetly said, hey, honey, I think you got some gum in your hair. And so as she pretended oh, to pull gum out of the child's she hair, she carefully plucked a few strands and put them inside of a napkin and put it inside of her pocket. And then three days later, she brought that hair inside of that plastic baggie and she gave it to the legislator and basically said, here's anything. what I think happened. I think she stole my kid. You know, can you test it for DNA to prove that girl is my daughter? And the legislator oh, was like, shit. okay, I'll give it a shot. And lo and behold, that so hair cute. would prove that girl at the party was her daughter. She did not die. How did I steal somebody's Carolyn baby? Carolyn was sentenced to nine to thirty years. Girl, in jail and hell after. She originally had an arson charge okay. against her as well, but investigators could not actually prove how the fire started, and so they ultimately dropped those charges. Officials also launched an inquiry into how the fire department had handled the original investigation, because Luce had tried to convince fire officials that you know maybe her daughter had not died in the blaze, maybe she was just missing. Because when Luce went into the nursery, she claimed she couldn't even find her daughter but investigators had told her that the fire had burned so hot that basically her daughter had been totally incinerated and that's why she couldn't find her mm. in the end though because of her refusal to ever give up Luce oh. was ultimately reunited with her daughter Delamar okay so if you oh my god nah these stories were wild <laughs> he he, he coming with some bangers uh, as of recent it, it appears what the hell that's wild why would you do that to somebody? And she knew them? That That's fucked. That's fucked. Everybody's to blame. Even the fire department, y'all to blame. Because once again, I need to ask my homie because he a firefighter. <laughs> like, even, even like if a fire has taken place for a while, there should be some, some type of remain, some type of DNA, something left behind. No? Even like pieces of clothes or bone or something. 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 You know, so that that already was says. But anyway, very interesting two stories. Y'all let me know what y'all thought. 
about these stories. And if you want to see more reactions from Mr. Ballin, engage in the comments, okay? When you leave comments and engage, it makes the video a bit more visible, more people see it, and the analytics will reflect to me that y'all are interested in this content. But if you're not interested, then it doesn't make sense for me to keep reacting to it on a regular basis, you feel me? Even if a couple people are requesting it here and there, I'm just not going to react to it if overall y'all don't care. Anyway, y'all let me know what y'all think about this though. Let me know what other videos you want to watch and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye!